Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in TradFi, digital assets, technology, and financial planning. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ Market Site is Martin Seamus, Vice President and Head of Wealth Planning at Janie Montgomery Scott, Jay Bass, Leader and Vice President of Finance at Rise Advisors, and Robert Conzo, CEO and Managing Director at the Wealth Alliance. National Financial Literacy Month is recognized each year in April to raise public awareness of the importance of financial literacy and maintaining smart money management habits. Our panel joins me to discuss why financial planning is not a one-size-fits-all model, meeting your long-term goals and selecting the right advisors. Gentlemen, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to Market Site. Welcome to Trade Talks. Before we get into the conversation, let's quickly go around the horn here. Martin, we'll start with you. Explain to us where Jenny Montgomery Scott fits within the financial planning ecosystem. Yeah, so Jenny Montgomery Scott is a regional broker dealer. We've got about 900 advisors, over 120 branch offices in the East Coast. Uh, primarily, um, you know, we work with everyone really, from massive affluent advisors all the way up through the uh, the uber wealthy. So it's uh, you know we kind of a uh, you know serve it all when it comes to financial planning and investment. All right, Jay, tell us about Rise Advisors. Yeah, so Rise is a multifamily office uh, servicing athlete entrepreneurs. Essentially, what we do is we manage their global portfolios, but ultimately our goal is to help them become world class entrepreneurs and bridge that educational gap that they typically lack. So. Um, that's kind of what we do and who we are. All right, and the Wealth Alliance, Robert. So we are a multi-location uh, financial advisory firm that handles all levels of planning on all different types of clients. Um, boutique firm dealing with mass, mass, mass affluent down to uh, more modest people. Right, and so we can see here that there certainly is diversity of the investor base here. Um, let's start with you, Jay, for a moment. Why is financial planning for all types of investors? When I think about an athlete retiring, having millions of dollars, kind of sounds like they're set up for life. Yeah, yeah. So typically that is the case for uh, the outside viewer. A lot of people think that, hey, you go make 20, 30, 40 million dollars that, you know, you're, you're set for life. But essentially that's not the dynamic for a lot of athletes. A lot of athletes are the pillars of their communities or they're the, the leader of their families. And when football or basketball or baseball, whatever the case, when it stops, they, they don't understand that all that cash flow and that spending, will, it, it needs to decrease. So without a financial plan, it'll end, end up running out and that generational wealth that you set out and you work so hard to achieve, it kind of diminishes and is gone by the next generation. So the financial plan is, is, is essential to what, what we do for our guys. And Martin, when you think about ultra high net worth individuals, it seems like they're set as well, but really there's so much more to than just having that liquidity in a bank. There's so many facets that goes along. Oh, absolutely. Particularly when you're working with high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals, it gets very complex. And, and we often find folks with a lot of money lose track very easily of where the money comes from and where the money goes. So a financial plan will often help sort of account for the cash flows. Um, you know, think of it similar to if, if you ran a business. You wouldn't run a business without a plan, without good accounting, and particularly when you're in that high net worth space, you know, millions of dollars, um, you know, you're really looking at the financial plan as your personal business plan. Right. And so, Robert, it's not just about investing. No. Right? No. I think all too many times the financial plan is deemed an investment plan, and there's just so much more, as you just, yep. two gentlemen just mentioned. You really have to start with an overall concept of the holistic view and then move into all the levels of financial planning that surround it. Investment is one side of it. Yeah. Many times it could be the smallest side of it. Yeah. Estate planning, succession, and insurance, and, and estate equalization, and the list goes on and on. So I think financial planning is a crucial, crucial part to an overall picture, whether you're a $30 million person or a $500,000 person. Yeah. Right. And we were talking about this off camera before, Martin, that when you exit a business or if you come into a big inheritance or a big amount, you know, windfall of cash that you don't want to get ahead of yourself and yeah. start spending. You know, it's one thing to have that 10,000 square foot mansion, but then you need gardeners and cleaning staff and <laughs> maintenance staff. Yep. And yeah. that's, that's <laughs> yeah. a, you know, a boat. It's like that's 250 true. grand a year <laughs> to maintain. Right. Yeah. And we see this a lot. A lot of folks think of it primarily with lottery winners, right? We think of the lottery winners and almost every big lottery winner has run out of money within a few years and is bankrupt. And a financial plan really helps protect from that, right? You don't have to win the lottery to receive a windfall, whether it's an inheritance, whether it's a business sale, having a plan, and particularly having a plan in place before that event happens, 
helps put some real structure around how do you respond to that windfall, that inheritance, that you know, business sale that you receive. And it really helps keep those impulses in check. You know, as, as we were saying, we get a lot of folks who say, great, a lot of money, I'm gonna go buy that boat without realizing I need somebody to clean the boat and man the boat and I need the maintenance on the boat. And suddenly that all adds up and before you know it, you're out of money. So the plan puts that all in perspective helps you understand what you can afford and kind of keeps all of that in check. Yeah, and I would imagine it's it's an even more nuanced case for an athlete. I mean, what is it, usually five to seven years, I believe, is the average of an NFL player, maybe even- It's even less. Uh, even less, depending, yeah. depending on the position that you're, you're playing. And you know, you almost live in this isolated bubble where the league and managers and everything are taking care of your day-to-day -day stuff while you're on the road and kind of living that life. And then reality hits the next year when you're not. Right, right. So kind of kind of what Martin was saying, my biggest thing is if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Mm -hmm. And you know, with sports, all we know is that there is an end date and what we don't know is when it's going to happen. Right. You know, yeah. there's guys in a locker room that are making a million dollars and there's a guy that's living a life of $30 million of income. But they, because they are in the same locker room in the same atmosphere, they feel that they can live the same lifestyle. But when it's all said and done, you know, the cash flow stops, but your spending has to take a step back. But a lot of times they can't do that because they put themselves in leadership positions in their families where mom is expecting that support and she's dependent on that support. So if you're not creating a plan to take a step back, let's plan out the next 20, 30 years. Let's, let's get our children and, 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 and anyone that's dependent upon us, you know, to, to figure out kind of where we are, you know, now that that income is not coming and create some cash flow, it's going to be all gone. Yeah, well, I mean, a startup, it's not like you're going to, you know, make multiple millions of dollars a year in the first year. I mean, the expectation, you do good if you break even. Right. So, right. I mean, the budget is just as important. It almost sounds like it's, it's you know, Robert, whether you are an athlete, because I would imagine the scale's all relative, right? right. $500,000 might be a lot to me, yeah. whereas five million is more acceptable to someone else. Yeah, and, and to Jay's point, you could have, let's forget an athlete for a second, you could have a person who ran a plumbing company, bought two yep. buildings in South Brooklyn, and 30 years later, each building is worth $40 million. And that's, that's happened. Yep. And when you, that person is an incredibly underserved part of the market, because he or she is looking at them as a, I'm a plumber, you know, I, I work hard and I, I bought this and I got a windfall in that case. Yeah. And when you have that person, there's, we keep talking about a plan, a plan, a plan. You have to be willing as a financial advisor to do a lot of work up front to set up for what needs to be done. And, and, and if it's all about the sale, you're not going to do the right job. Right. So I, I, I think it's an incredibly satisfying field on many, many levels because you, you just see the gamut. And those type of people, they really need you and appreciate you, and it feels great. Right. Well, if we shift gears and talk about the industry for a moment, that's why we've seen the uptick in independent advisors so that they have more autonomy in terms of how they want to help manage money. Right, right. right. So that's a great point. And we're an independent RIA. Uh, my partner Eric Denton and myself grew up in the wirehouse world for many, many, many years, and we went independent. Um, and what we noticed happening, we could have never predicted. Number one, it was incredibly self-satisfying. It was a moonshot. And what ultimately happened as a result was what became available to us was was much greater, and allowed us to do. Well, number one, things like this. Right. I wouldn't be doing this. If <laughs> right. Well, I mean, Martin, I'm sure you see it, um, you know, as you're working with so many advisors, but how technology has enabled them to have more empathetic conversations, more Absolutely. personalized conversations. Yeah. And it seems as if personalization, that's what clients want. Yeah. I mean, we've really seen a shift, I think, across the investment business, the advice business, to an advisory relationship typically generating a financial plan or using a financial plan to help guide that. And when you think about the reason why, um, you know, we're talking a lot about investments, but financial planning fundamentally changes the sort of role of the advisor and the client and in, in, in the way that they work together. By having a financial plan in place, by using a financial plan, it becomes about the investor as opposed to being about the investments that I want to sell you. So when we talk about you know, the millionaire next door or professional athletes, really figuring out what do they need individually, no matter who the investor is, 
that's the financial plan. Right? You know, getting into who are you, what are you expecting, what do you need, and then how can we help you get there? That's when all of the investments, the products, the sales, everything else comes into play. Yeah, and when you think about an advisor that works best for you, Jay, right? You know, in many cases, as you were alluding to before, this could potentially be the family's first time seeing that kind of wealth. And you want to preserve that, you want to maintain it, you want to make it generational, not just one generation. Definitely. So for us, the biggest thing for us is legacy planning. Okay. Um, financial planning is, is, a, is a big part of it, but legacy planning, what are you going to do beyond the sport? Because a lot of times spending for these guys are you know, 800 to a million dollars. Well, that's not sustainable. So how are you going to produce cash flow? And what is something to be able to pass on to your children? And that first thing for that is bridging that educational gap. So like most of you all, that you got, you're, you're all uh, clients have built a high net worth because they have businesses or they've created generational wealth that way where our guys have you know, relied on a sport. Mm -hmm. So building that legacy beyond the sport, are you gonna be an entrepreneur? Are you gonna be a board member? Are you going to, you know, I, I don't know, step into the financial space, whatever the case may be we have to create that legacy plan because that is what's going to educate your family. That's going to sustain the wealth, right. the education gap. That, that, that's, a, that's a very good point there from, there are people that have a monetary event where they're selling a business or whatever, and they'll sit down with a professional, like an estate planning attorney, whatever, and try to do estate planning. But if you're not laying out what that looks like in the future, you could have a situation where Forget estate planning, they're gonna run out of money. Yep. Don't worry about protecting it, there is no money. Mm -hmm. Or you could have a situation whereby it's just the opposite. You have a person who spends within their means and it, and it goes like this, and suddenly the estate plan that you set up without looking at over here is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So before you just jump the gun and do investments and do estate planning, mm -hmm. it, the, 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 the planning that these gentlemen are speaking about is so necessary for all the other steps. You just got to be willing to do it. Yeah, like I would, I would imagine as as a client, um, you know, certainly the size of the clients that you three take on, it's got to be you know, between accounting, estate planning, managing homes, and it, I mean, it seems very overwhelming to me to be able to figure <laughs> all of that out. And they rely on you to say, okay, these are all the touch points. These are the different alliance groups that we work with, and right. you know, our CPAs, our accountants, our estate planners, our attorneys. Um, so it, it doesn't feel as if you know, you're just my broker, you're just my financial planner. It's almost like you're a life, not life coach, but you're putting all the pieces together. Yeah, I think the, the name of our company is The Wealth Alliance, and Alliance came to be not by mistake. We are a firm that aligns with the clients outside professionals. Mm -hmm. There's no way you're gonna be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. And if you create this group of people or work with their professionals and surround the client with solutions, then right. the daunting task becomes very, very manageable. But you have to play in the sandbox well with everyone. Yeah. Right. Correct. You know, you gotta keep the egos at the door. Right, so for example, if you had a professional athlete that came to, to you, right. and, oh, by the way, we know Jay and Rise Advisors, they could help you, you know, onto your next part, so you're all working together to manage finances and also grow their careers. Kind of a random question, Jay, is there, are there certain industries that athletes gravitate towards? I mean, not everyone's gonna be a broadcaster, you can, I mean, you can only leverage your name, image, and likeness so much. Yeah, so a lot of guys, honestly, they like to start restaurants uh, for, for the most part. <laughs> Athletes I mean, love to I want to start a restaurant. Yeah, you know, it's just something that, you know, when in their community, they can, they can recognize with and they can affiliate with. So that's, that's something that they like to start to do. Or they would like to leverage, you know, who they were as an athlete and, and go into the broadcasting and being on, you know, these big ESPN and things like that. Um, but kind of back to what you were saying about it being overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had to teach you cover four, you know, and, and on defense, it'd be overwhelming. And all these X's and O's and these, if I had to teach the spread offense, it'd be very overwhelming, but it's repetition. So with these guys exposing them and give, getting them reps, a lot of times we don't make decisions out of fear. And it could have been the best decision ever. But if we get, if we bridge that gap of your knowledge to what we're doing, then that, the fear is eliminated. And now you can make educated decisions on how do I want to set up my family for life? So just slowly spoon feeding, and this is across all gamuts, you right. know, you oh, see yeah. your clients not making decisions just out of fear yeah. or selling out of fear. Or if you have yeah. a, a widower, you have a widower. Uh, there's a, a person who, uh, we have many men who women run the household and that woman passes away. 
and vice versa. And the person literally doesn't even know. And they have millions and millions of dollars, just like the athlete. That person needs to be handheld, spoon-fed, and trained and learn. You never want a financial advisor to say, don't worry, I got it. Those are the kiss of death words. Run away. <laughs> right? Um, so there's many different situations where you have to be willing to teach, educate, and listen. Right. And that's the great part about having a plan or having a plan or going through a planning process is you can bring in the rest of the family. I can't tell you how many clients I've sat with um, and asked, you know, have you spoken to your children about your wealth? Right. Mm. And the look right. of fear in their eyes. Right. No, right? I, no, I, I would no, never. I, I would right. never. They have no idea. What um, and the nice thing about going through a planning process is it takes that emotion out of it. And you can very factually then start bringing in you know, the next generation, the spouse that's not involved, yep. other advisors, informing them in a, in a much more sort of easy to digest way than having it sprung on you at the, you know, reading of the estate. It's right. such an emotional burden oh, too. Absolutely. You're not Usually. thinking clear, you're trying to process that's right. what's happening you know, from an emotional perspective and there's so many moving parts. I mean, you don't know where the bodies are buried necessarily. You would think, I'm hoping that the next gen advisors, next gen of investors, they're more open to having these kinds of conversations. Oh, sure. Are you seeing that in your practice where next gen advisors and, and younger investors are talking Yeah, very much so. At, at Janney, the, you know, we support about 900 advisors. And what we're seeing, the, the biggest trend right now is bringing in the next generation. And most frequently, they're coming in as a CFP professional. They're coming in as that planner who can really help sort of pull the plan together. Senior advisor is still the key relationship person but you've got somebody else on the team who's really focused on the facts, the figures, kind of assembling the plan. And it's a great way to introduce them to the relationship, the industry, and sort of all of the needs-based uh, Yeah, analysis. I think that second gen, um, it's interesting. At our firm, we're very big on CFP, form CPAs, and I think those designations help. Uh, but the thing that I think you have to teach the next gen is pick up the phone and call. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to be yeah. able to do this. And so I think they struggle with it a little, but as you train them and teach them and then they see the power of this, they quickly get it and they intermingle two things, this yes. and this, and yeah. it becomes incredibly yeah. accretive. I don't think it has to be robo-advisor versus traditional right. advisor. Right. There right. is a way to There's marry, like you know, TradFi yeah. and, and DeFi and so forth to marry right. the two of those. And as we've seen over the past couple of years where there's volatility back in the market mm -hmm. and stocks aren't going from the bottom left to the top right of the chart, right, right. That, <laughs> yeah. right? You, do, yeah. you do need some hand-holding there. Yeah. 100%. I think it comes down to just getting back to, when you think about people that are in the medical field, you know they have a passion for it. When you think about people that are in education, you know they have a passion for it. With people stepping into the financial field, especially financial planning, when you feel that your passion and your purpose is to help people get to the next step, there's no need to gatekeep information and, hey, just give me everything and I'll take yeah. care of it. Right. You share that because you're a practitioner. At the end of the day, you know, when if something is going on with your spine, you're looking for the best spine doctor in the, in the country. And they're not gatekeeping any information because right. they understand that I'm the best right. at what I do, but let me educate you so that you can make a sound decision and help me guide me and let me in. So sure, yeah. that, that's kind of what I'm seeing more in, into the younger, younger generation as far as stepping into the financial planning world and space. All right, we will leave that on a positive note. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us on Trade Talks. And thanks for joining me from Market Site. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Market Reporter at NASDAQ.